This presentation is called, How Do We Know Who Our Kin Are? And we're going to be looking at why that's an interesting question. And it's interesting because of Hamilton's rule. So if Hamilton's rule is correct, then genetic kinship should be central to our social lives. And most of us should spend a lot of time with our close genetic kin and assist them. Another way of saying this is that Hamilton's rule predicts nepotism, and that's simply favoritism towards relatives. And we're certainly not surprised when we see parents um, do things that favor their children. If you're the dictator of uh, North Korea, it means that you pass on leadership to your own son, whether he's qualified to lead or not. Now, a fundamental problem arises on the basis of Hamilton's rule, and that problem has to do with what's called kin recognition. And that's simply the question, how do we know uh, who our kin are? How can we be biased towards them unless we know who they are? And this is illustrated in relation to humans uh, by this open source photo of the Brady Bunch from a famous television show in the United States. But actually nobody in this photo is a close relative to anyone else. But the three boys are not brothers, the three girls are not sisters, and nobody in the photo is the offspring of Florence Henderson. And nonetheless, in watching the show, we freely uh, go along with this idea that we're watching siblings. Now, if we consider other primates and we say, well, how do they know who their kin are? When it comes to mothers and offsprings, there's often this tight maternal bond uh, that's very strong. And that leads in gorillas and chimpanzees to what's called constant contact mothering. And that's a pretty good way to figure out who your kin are, um, is to hang on to them. Um, but in the case of chimpanzees, how do you know who your father is? And this proves much more difficult for chimps to discern. Uh, chimps do not appear to know who their father is. So this question, uh, the famous question, uh, who's your daddy? Ask that of a chimpanzee and they just have to shrug their shoulders. And a conclusion to a recent review of the behavior of primates with regard to kin is that in a wide variety of primate species, males sometimes care for offspring to whom they are unrelated. So a number of possible proximate mechanisms of kin recognition have been proposed. Uh, one of those is odor, uh, which might be true of other primates, but probably isn't true of humans. And uh, this is because primates as a whole have reduced olfaction. Since with humans, our sense of smell really isn't very good. It's also been suggested that visual cues are important, and certainly primates have great vision. Uh, this little Tarzer, uh, which is a very archaic form of primate, has very big eyes uh, that are hooked into its brain differently than other primates. Um, but despite that, uh, tests tend to show that what that allows is an ability to recognize individuals, that we're better at recognizing individuals than sorting out kin by visual cues. And the last uh, approximate mechanism proposed is simple proximity. And this holds that uh, we tend to treat as kin those who hang out with us when we're young. And similarly, we're going to treat as kin uh, those adults that care for us. And most of the time, that's probably going to be genetic relatives. So all of those are proximate explanations. They answer the question or pose the question, what aspects of our functional biology allow us to recognize our kin? And in an evolutionary sense, Hamilton's rule is an ultimate explanation because it's an attempt to explain why kin recognition would have evolved in the first place. How would that have given a reproductive advantage? So beyond our parents, uh, there's the whole problem of how we recognize siblings. And beyond our siblings, how we recognize the siblings of our parents. 
and then how we recognize the offspring of the siblings of our parents and our grandparents, and we work out from there. And part of the answer does appear to be simply who stays around and who involves themselves in caring for us. So this is something social anthropologists have stressed quite vigorously. They think it's contrary to Hamilton's rule, but it's actually not. Uh, all that matters for Hamilton's rule is that there be some proximate mechanism for recognizing kin. It says nothing about uh, what sort of mechanism that might be. Part of that, then, is addressed by the concept of philopatry. And the philopatric uh, sex is simply the sex that remains in the natal group. So generally what we see is that one sex disperses uh, and the other sex stays in their group. And this helps to spread the genes around and prevent uh, excessive inbreeding. So if we look across primates, uh, what we'll find is that female philopatry is found in some old world monkeys. Uh, macaques form matrilines. And the dominant matrilines have the higher reproductive fitness. In other words, the best way to get ahead if you're a macaque is to belong to the most powerful group of females. And then you'll eat first and your offspring will have a better chance of surviving. Chimpanzees, on the other hand, practice male philopatry, but they do not form patrilines. And this is probably, again, because of the difficulty of recognizing relationships through the father. Um, despite not forming patrilines, and that, by that we mean uh, a father and sons, just as matrilines would be a mother and her sisters and daughters, despite that, chimpanzees do favor their maternal brothers. And so these would be other males who share the same mother with them. And presumably they know who shares the same mother because they're familiar with them being in the proximity of the same mother. So humans then are just a variation on this theme. And the theme is that familiarity breeds kindliness. So a key mechanism of kin recognition is simply familiarity and being around. Uh, humans do have sex bias dispersal patterns, but what makes us different is we have a very wide variety of those dispersal patterns, and sometimes it involves both sexes dispersing in highly irregular ways. We do, however, discriminate kin from non-kin and closer kin from more distant kin, and we do that in a rather unique and distinctive fashion, and this is what social anthropologists call kin terminologies. We're not going to talk much about kin terminologies. They're the bane of all students in anthropology. I love the topic, uh, but if you want to learn more about that, you can start with Anth 102, Social Cultural Anthropology, and then we have an upper division course that focuses just on kinship. So thank you for listening.